At almost one and a half miles in length, you would expect the condition of Queensbury Tunnel to be quite variable, reflecting the influence of geological changes, the presence of adjacent mine workings, water ingress and the flooding which afflicted it for four decades. The observations made in this video are based on visual inspections and insight from experienced engineers, but to gain a sharper picture, tactile and intrusive investigations will be needed. It is, however, fair to say that some parts of the tunnel are relatively good, others, quite obviously, are very poor. We'll begin our tour at the south end, where, for the first 140 yards, both the side walls and arch were built in stone. The engineer, John Fraser, seems to have regarded stone as stronger than brick and therefore specified it where the load was likely to be greatest, near the entrances and at the shafts. The drawdown of water during repeated pumping operations has had an impact on the masonry facework, causing it to sag and become loose in places. One small patch at the haunch on the down or southeast side fell some years ago, but a larger area was lost on the up or northwest side during the summer of 2017 following a flooding event. These patches will have to be rebuilt, the surrounding areas first being stitched and repointed to prevent further failures. <laughs> Number 1 shaft is located 122 yards into the tunnel and has a concrete cap at its base. The drainage through the cap seems to be blocked, resulting in a considerable depth of water accumulating at the bottom of the shaft. This is finding its way out and then filtering through the tunnel lining. As a result, much of the stonework here is wet. The drainage, therefore, needs to be re-established. As the arch becomes brick, a set of bullhead rail arches was installed to provide additional support, although most of the laggings and wedges have either rotted away or fallen out. For the next 200 yards, much of the brickwork is spalled and will have to be replaced, either by breaking out individual bricks or undertaking patch repairs. Many areas need repointing. There is considerable water ingress here, the worst of which can be controlled using pans and pipes, as at Grenofen Tunnel in Devon. Most of the defects encountered so far have been minor and can be repaired at a relatively modest cost using methods captured in network rail standards. However, a different approach will be required adjacent to number 2 shaft, 400 yards into the tunnel, where a refuge on the upside is badly fractured and a diagonal bulge has developed, extending up into the length of lining that helps to support the shaft. There are deep open joints in the stonework and an adjacent area has in the past had to be patch repaired in brick. Number 2 shaft is in the poorest condition of the five that connect with the tunnel. Except in the summer, a huge volume of water enters the shaft via an adit 65 feet up. This will need to be controlled, collected and discharged into the drain, which itself needs refurbishing. Beyond the shaft is another set of bullhead rail arches, this time on concrete footings. The tunnel is generally much drier through this section and the brick arch affected by fewer defects, although there are small areas of spalling and open joints. Around 580 yards from the southern entrance is a patch of missing brickwork at the downside haunch, the inner leaf exhibiting very little mortar. This was an accepted method of construction, but an intervention will be required here to prevent a future collapse. After 742 yards, we arrive at number 3 shaft, the deepest of the five at 379 feet, which had a secondary lining inserted in the 1930s. The brickwork remains in good condition, but the seven reinforced concrete frames which transfer the additional load into the surrounding rock are badly degraded and will have to be repaired. Prior to the provision of permanent pumps, flood water often extended more than a thousand yards into the tunnel. This view, which was taken during the summer and looks south towards number 3 shaft, shows a high watermark at the haunch about 11 feet up. This seasonal rise and fall is likely to have had some impact on the lining's condition. Defects continue to be few and minor until a point about 60 yards north of number 3 shaft. 
Beyond here, the tunnel enters the zone of influence from coal workings. Although the railway bought a pillar of coal to ensure the tunnel was properly supported, the lining is being overloaded and severe defects have emerged at several locations over a distance of about 500 yards. Significant interventions will be required. The smaller of two partial collapses occurred 860 yards into the tunnel, affecting an area in the upside haunch where brickwork had been lost one or two rings deep. This reduced the strength of the arch, which is five rings thick, to such an extent that it was unable to withstand the increasing loads being applied to it. About 80 yards further north, beyond two areas of spalled brickwork at the Crown, is a long-standing longitudinal fracture which had been stabilised using wedges. Between 2010 and 2012, the lining sheared at the southern end of this fracture, causing another to form parallel with it and pushing the higher part of the arch upwards by around 200 millimetres over the adjacent brickwork. The other partial collapse, dating from early in 2013, is 50 yards to the north and affects the downside haunch. This is what the area looked like in 2007. Charles Gripper's 1879 book, Railway Tunnelling in Heavy Ground, makes clear that it is not necessary to set every brick separately in a bed of mortar, excepting those on the face. One course of the whole thickness must be well grouted with mortar and a good layer spread over the top of it. This demonstrates the significance of losing the inner ring and the disproportionate reduction in strength that results sufficient to allow a collapse. On the upside of this location, the inner ring is separating and lipping over the adjacent brickwork. This possibly marks the edge of a patch repair, a number of which were carried out through this section in the 1920s using engineering brick. These act as stiffer anomalies within the arch and are more resistant to bending under load. There is therefore a tendency for them to separate at their longitudinal edges, partly as a result of poor bonding. Extensive spalling has occurred at both the crown and low to mid haunch. There is also flattening of the arch on the upside, an area of missing brickwork and some bulging. It's generally accepted that further collapses will occur between the northernmost collapse and number 4 shaft unless work is carried out to install a secondary lining, making the existing one redundant. <laughs> Number 4 shaft is located 1,165 yards or two-thirds of a mile into the tunnel and is in fair condition. It is though generally wet and much of the lining is coated with mineral deposits. Below it is a single track panel left by the salvage crew when the track was lifted in 1963. The tunnel is largely free of visible defects for the next 750 yards. There is however some isolated brickwork spalling and two areas where the lining is severely bulged. The first of these is about 55 yards north of number 4 shaft, affecting the up side wall and haunch. There is also some bulging on the downside. After a further 100 yards, a severe bulge has developed at the down haunch, resulting in loose or hanging bricks and open joints. We are now 500 yards from the north end of the tunnel. This refuge was built in 1883, just five years after the railway opened, during extensive repairs resulting from a combination of poor workmanship and the mining of a two feet thick coal seam immediately alongside the tunnel, which had to be repacked with stone. Around 220 yards of the upside wall was reconstructed, together with 18 feet of arch. Two hatches were inserted at the crown to allow voids above the arch to be inspected. Water accumulating in the mine workings has filtered through the lining, extensively coating it with calcite. Of note here is a large bulge in the upside wall, the re-emergence of cracks at the haunch on the downside and spalling at the crown. Remediation will be required through most of this section. A quarter of a mile from the north end of the tunnel is a pair of vertical timbers on which the up-distance signal was mounted. For 80 yards here, there are no recorded defects. We then enter a section of about 300 yards through which loose panels of the brickworks in a ring were removed in the 1990s 
to allow safe access for research staff undertaking grouting experiments. These were carried out just beyond three isolated lengths of stone arch, marking the location of a geological fault. The grouting required an array of holes to be called through the lining and the breaking out of a transverse slot. The fifth and last ventilation shaft is located about 140 yards from the exit. Considerable volumes of water pour down it, but this situation can be improved by installing field drainage and repairing the broken pipework. The panels of missing brickwork continue for another 60 yards to a point where the arch reverts to stone. Some of the construction joints through this final section have opened and become stepped. There's also spalled stonework and bulging at one location in the upside haunch and a number of missing stones in the down sidewall adjacent to the portal. However, these are not major defects. Most of Queensbury Tunnel is in fair condition. Some sections are largely free of visible defects. However, lots of routine repairs are clearly needed to make it fit for public use and around 15% of the tunnel will demand deep and extensive remediation. This is achievable at a sustainable cost, but only if a proportionate and pragmatic repair scheme is developed by the right people with the right skills, mindset and insight. Mm -hmm.